Fun. Yes, right now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ninth edition of the TechWadi Abana webinar series. My name is Vanessa, and I'm honored to be here hosting our esteemed guest, Mohammed Shahada, who will be speaking with us on lessons learned from building cutting edge technologies. He is the CEO, he is the CEO and founder of IDEN TV, and he is also the founder and co-chair of AppTech. Um, so he'll be uh, talking with us a lot about his experiences. Um, and for those of you watching, uh, please follow us on Twitter at hashtag TWWADI.org. And without further ado, Mohammed, if you want to take the floor and, um, and tell us a little bit about your story. Great. Uh, good. Morning, good afternoon, and good evening, I guess, in different time zones. Uh, uh, Mohammed Shahada, and first, thank you, Takwadi, for the opportunity of, to speak to uh, the audience and the participants. And I um, hope uh, that people, if they have any question or remark or uh, explanation or whatever, they certainly welcome to send a, a message. I guess it's organized by uh, the chat, send a message to the group, and uh, hopefully Vanessa or Amal will, will be able to relay the question and we can, um, we can, I can explain or answer if I, uh, based on what I know. So to start, uh, again, I've been in the States for a long time now, I guess. I started here as an exchange student. I come from Jordan. Uh, parents, uh, uh, my father was in the army, and in a uh, long time, 1968, uh, I was selected. I went to the madrasa, the uh, Arab Revolution School, or uh, Nasser, uh, which is a military type for the military uh, uh, and uh, for the kids of the military, uh, just soldiers and officers. So uh, in 1968, we, three students were selected to come to the states and live with an american family and go to high school i did that and went back to jordan did the tawjihi of course and then came back again to go to school so i went to university i did my undergraduate in math and my graduate degree in computer and information science so that's long time ago i guess um uh, what I wanted to speak about and is the technology that we have deployed, developed, deployed. Uh, some of it we have sold and exit uh, some of that technology and companies. And we certainly are engaged. Uh, when I say we, mostly my partner and myself, Mudar Yaghi, which we go back to the college days. And we continue to be friends and partners. And we started several companies and we have uh, some of them succeeded, some did not, and certainly uh, uh, we have exited many of them. So I want to talk about this experience and this uh, uh, company. From, from college, I worked uh, in the background, I worked as in the software industry, I was uh, uh, compilers, if you remember the compilers days, well, they still exist compiler maintenance and design. Uh, and then in late 82, went back to Jordan where I worked in banks. I worked in developing banking system, branches, uh, head office, ledgers, uh, the various banking systems, letters of credit, letters of guarantee, bills, all. If you worked ever in a bank, you will remember or you'll know the different aspects of the banking systems. I did the ATM, the first ATM in Jordan, and credit card systems, insurance, and general financial systems. So that's, that's my um, first job. And then I realized I probably would rather establish a company and be my own boss. I didn't want to continue in that business of being an employee. So uh, started a company and uh, you know, we worked uh, a couple of years and I felt uh, starting a company in Jordan or the Middle East in general carries a lot of uh, issues with it. Uh, uh, partially at those days, the 80s, uh, some of you might recall, uh, if you were born there uh, then, uh, that software was not as valued or as not 
as appreciated as today. And if, if these days we were working with mainframes, the PCs just the beginning of the 80s, uh, working on 286, 386, if you remember these, uh, again, hardware. So uh, uh, companies that needed to automate, we needed, uh, you know, a budget, whether it's the hardware in terms of servers, bigger, whether at that time IBM, uh, 4300s or different IBMs, uh, models and also borrows um, uh, and other machines and CR. So uh, people at that time, I felt that the software industry was uh, not advancing fast enough. We had a lot of problems in our pricing. We had issues in how people view software, customization, development from scratch, implementing package, localization of packages, all the different issues. But I think one of the biggest problem that I felt aside from uh, looking at software uh, different than real estate. Buying a building is always different than buying software. So bringing a software and a desk and saying, oh, here, this is 10,000 dinars. Uh, people did not really take that lightly. While, you know, I don't know, our 10,000 dinars is fine. Okay, so we, we had issues. But the biggest issue that I felt, which probably hopefully uh, the Middle East and the Arab world got rid of a lot of it, is the transparency. So uh, having awards or RFPs and that, that system was not really transparent. It, it, the merits of the proposal was not always the, the measure for winning business. So uh, probably till now here and there you will hear about these things, but I think we have advanced significantly in that area and business people and companies uh, look at that aspect as, as, uh, as something that uh, uh, does not play right for the developer, does not play right for the company, it does not protect their interest, it does not reward them. So more and more, I believe uh, the, the market itself uh, became more transparent and therefore uh, uh, more uh, scrutiny to how do you award. So, uh, those some of the problems I I think I faced quite a bit uh, running a software company for two years in Jordan. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit the political situation, that the wars and this and that. I felt that the Middle East has limitation in growth. I moved back to the states, uh, and uh, certainly the technology at that time in the states uh, has been more advanced. Uh, at that time, we started Aptech in nineteen. Uh, 89-90 and uh, we wanted to serve applications. We called it applications technology. We wanted that just a, an umbrella name that can give us the flexibility to start anything we really want. So uh, a thought came to us sitting in a restaurant that hey it would be cool to, to have a, uh, an English uh, article or an English piece of paper, put it in a scanner, and from the other end on the computer comes Arabic. So we wanted to kind of integrate the OCR with a, a translation capabilities. Uh, 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 those times, Arabic machine, so we want basically to develop an Arabic machine translation system. Uh, at that time, most of the research in the machine translation was focused on English or German or uh, French, nothing in Arabic, uh, ve or very limited, you know, uh, to have the computer being able to understand the syntax, the morphology, the, the, the semantics of the language, especially when it's Arabic, was extremely hard, and uh, a lot of people have avoided venturing in that space, so we decided, no, this is what we want to do. We didn't want to go in the financial, I, you know, uh, mother and I decided not to go back in the financial systems, but to really move on to more something challenging and something that we believe it, uh, it carries its, re its rewards. So um, we started machine translation. Uh, mother has more the linguistic background. I have more the, tech, the computer programming background, let me say. Uh, uh, so, uh, we started that and certainly we had very, very little money. So obviously, as, uh, as you can tell, we came, I come from humble beginnings. My father was a soldier. So regardless of how much you save, coming to the States and starting to sta uh, establish a company is a very costly thing. We realized very fast that we need funding. We had uh, invited partners, we got some funding, 
that uh, based on what we were trying to do and um, the complicated task that we were doing, uh, generating business and revenue was a very tough task. So uh, uh, I would say we were more optimistic that we're going to develop something that sells fast. I thought we're going to solve it faster than uh, what it is, and it proved to be a very complex problems that we were facing. So, um, just to give you an example, you know, we had we use something called lexical functional grammar, which relies on analysis of the language transfer and generation. So, uh, uh, we needed to understand the Arabic sentence. So, uh, the morphology of Arabic, I had to learn relearn it from my high school days. Uh, 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 and that was not easy. Uh, learning that and making the computer understanding is another another problem. So we 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 contracted and we worked first with mother's father, Dr. Abdul Rahman Yaghi. Uh, we thank him and also Dr. Nihad Al Musa, which helped us in the, from Jordan University of Jordan. That those people helped us quite a bit to understand the language and they were patient where we were able to, to kind of transpose that understanding into a computer language. Uh, anyway, long story, we succeeded in generating some contracts. So we started with Muller and myself, uh, uh, employees. Uh, we had to even go on a very limited shoestring budget where we lived on the credit cards here and there and uh, trying to get a contract and we succeeded uh, Arabic was a hot subject always. We succeeded in getting a contract, winning between uh, on an RFP from 17 companies and universities in the US. Uh, we competed, we won the contract, and that was our first uh, business. I have to say that, the, which is a big difference between the Middle East and the US, there is more tolerant to R&D projects supported by the government here than in, in the Middle East. And that, I mean, people who are familiar with the R&D community know that so many things were initially developed on the government's dime, as we would say. Uh, uh, later on, these were brought out to the commercial uh, arena. So we had, we, had, uh, we had the chance to win the contract and build, start building the business. 1997-98, the dot-com became more and more. And we felt, you know, as you know, uh, companies, uh, as the saying today goes, companies are bought, not sold. I think at that time, companies were sold, uh, not bought. People were building and selling companies based on ideas, uh, non-tangible. And I think we just rode that wave. And in 1998, um, uh, we had our first exit uh, that we sold to a company called Lernat on Hospi, which specializes in speech and wanted to complement speech with machine translation. So, <coughs> so at that time, I think, you know, that was my first experience in selling a company. And that was a process that was an eye opener, you know, uh, things like where do you start, negotiations, how do you determine value, uh, if you agree on a value, what are the next steps? So going through negotiations on a value and looking what makes a value, are we looking at the intellectual property as a value, are you looking at the revenue, are you looking at EBITDA? Are you looking at a unique monopolistic solution that you have? Are you looking at the contracts? Are you looking at the synergy? So there are so many factors that come in that finally says, oh, your company for us is worth X, okay? And that's what we ready to pay. Whether it's a, a, a instrument, is it cash, is it stock, is it uh, do you have an earnout, a concept of an earnout? Well, you promised us the earnout concept. You say your company has a growth pattern and it has a growth opportunity. Uh, are you trying, you know, to grow with that company and basically uh, uh, you bank or you bet that as you grow, you will be able to uh, generate more revenue to the acquirer and basically, uh, basically uh, uh, be able to uh, make money in terms of that earnout. So, I, I would say that process was was very, uh, very 
uh, learning experience for me in order to be able to finally say, okay, I sold that company. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit quickly about Aptech and I'm going to move to a screen and just, just so you will understand. And this is more of an Aptech today, okay? And Aptech today is, I, I hope you see my slides, right, Vanessa? Yes, I see yes. them. Okay. I see them. So basically, speech technology, we have developed speech technology and uh, the products, and again, I'm gonna go through the slides quickly and certainly I'll make them available to TechWadi in case people would like to, to have them, whether through the presentation or or separately. So uh, speech is big data. You know, when you talk about uh, voice uh, is, is uh, ambiguous. There is, there is everything today in technology, whether it's call center, whether it's media, whether it's uh, uh, telephones, whether it's uh, uh, interactive voice response system, whether it's Siri, whether it's uh, Hey Google, whether it's Cortana, voice is the predominant way in dealing with with data and dealing with technology and dealing with uh, uh, and dealing with uh, uh, services. So um, speech is big. I, I'm showing you a sample of the customers. We were successful. I mean, some of them helped us like MBC Group. Thank you. I mean, we worked with Al Arabiya where we did a lot of closed caption and subtitling using the technology. We worked with CNN, where Turkey, where we produce the Turkish. We're working with Sky News, where, where we have uh, live closed caption and things like that. I, again, um, we can go through that. Like I said, I'll make it available and certainly you can ask. Here's some of the automatic speech recognition uh, languages, the ASR. These are a list of the languages that we have. Um, the HMT, I, we call it hybrid machine translation. And without going into the technology, it uses rule-based and statistical. So it's more of a hybrid approach. These are the languages that we deal with and we are able to to translate whether with English or between themselves. Um, this is more dividing the market, media, machine translation, and telephony, and it shows you where media monitoring and closed captioning, subtitling, workbench, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, telephony, um, uh, continuous speech, IVR, uh, mobile, and uh, uh, of mobile. Uh, if you see the, the the workbench I mentioned, we have different products without going through them again. Uh, Cloud-based system capable of uh, uh, doing the subtitling and closed captioning and editing that uh, and generating the SRT, what we call the timestamp text that's associated with the audio and video. Live closed caption, obviously the regulations in, in many countries of the world for the Accessibility Act that TV, uh, whether it's linear on, uh, you know, watching TV or digital today online, uh, the government uh, requires that you show the text of what's being spoken or uh, um, uh, the lyrics even for songs uh, sometimes. So uh, live, clo uh, live captioning or uh, captioning, uh, closed captioning is a must. And we feel that the technology today is close, if not there, to be able to recognize at 95% as good or sometimes even better than somebody is trying to listen and type. Uh, subtitling, obviously you understand. Media monitoring, we are able to monitor hundreds of channels, transcribe the, the speech and be able to search and retrieve. Archival solution, millions of hours exist, whether it's on TV stations or, or uh, or others that you can search by word. Uh, today, only they have a very brief metadata that says, you know, this video is interview with Barack, with Barack Obama this year or that year. So there isn't the content of the uh, interview. When did Obama speak about the Affordable Act? When did Obama speak about Trump or something like that? There isn't those details, speech recognition, and archive solution allows you to do that. Uh, our IVR, we are able to interact. As I said, we have a company called Ignite that manages a million plus calls a month that you can call and order everything 
without the need to speak to a person. Uh, it makes it fast, more accurate, uh, and certainly uh, less cost. Conversational uh, system, we have systems that translate speech to speech, and finally, we have systems that allow you, we just did the PR press release today, we released Diva, which is the digital intelligent voice agent, where, you know, if you can download it from the Apple Store, you are able, it's integrated at the alpha stage today, you are able to say, hey, show me red shoes, show me uh, uh, iPhone 7, and it basically it brings, it links your speech and brings all the, uh, associated uh, uh, products from eBay or Amazon or something like that. It's a, it's a, it's a, an alpha product, but we wanted to share uh, the market. This is the Diva, and I hope uh, some of you can go to the Apple Store and download that starting today, I guess. Um, so that's, that's the, the aptic side, and I'm going to move back. And so... Uh, uh, I wanted I wanted to say a couple things on on Aptic. We we were able to build it, and we uh, after 2000 we did the management buyout uh, due to the fact that Alanech had problems with the SEC, and it was an opportunity to acquire the technology back from bankruptcy. So uh, we we basically did an MBO, and we succeeded in that uh, uh, MBO. Uh, to buy the company for a lot less than what we sold it for and we started rebuilding the company and we had another exit for uh, with a company that was more focused on government solutions uh, and did not see the commercial opportunity and we tried for two three years to tell them hey the the the, the revenue and the growth is really and that's i'm talking 2010 the growth is not just government and at that time even Siri wasn't there and even so many things were not there uh, YouTube did not was not able to transcribe we had all that technology and we were trying to push more to the commercial and while the government had a sequester in contract so it didn't really the synergy was not there so we did an MBO that uh, I, again, we had to focus on developing more of a commercial products to the technology. Uh, uh, I would have to say that, that exit represents another set of problems, and especially for people who are entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, many times you have to sign an uncompete, so basically you cannot develop the same technology again for three years at least, sometimes it's longer. Okay, uh, you also have to, uh, m many times you have to uh, uh, manage a process of transfer of technology to the new company and therefore now you have a boss and you have a committee and you have uh, 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 many people, you're not as free to make the decisions fast. Uh, uh, you're responsible and accountable and basically it's all your own business and money and therefore you have to be careful uh, uh, and therefore you, you as an entrepreneur kind of see the vision for this company and you decide uh, whether you want to uh, have a decision with uh, make that decision with an acquisition you're basically stuck somewhere Okay, and I'm talking about more the classical companies. I think Silicon Valley provides a, a smoother way of transition within a bigger organizations, and we can go on the on those uh, details. What makes that better? Uh, some of it is, uh, I would say, the understanding of entrepreneurship uh, spirits. Uh, uh, some of it is relating to uh, uh, the concept of aqua hire, aqui hire, that we're not just acquiring technology and we're not just acquiring revenue, we're not just acquiring customers, we are really acquiring a team. Uh, and when, when I, you will see that the trends today in the technology are major issues. And unless you have a proper team capable of de developing and deploying such high state-of-the-art technology, you're going to fail. So I would say those are some of the issues that I felt that were tough, uh, you know, when you get acquired. Uh, uh, I, I, then I, I guess um, what, what we did, 
after. So in, in 2014, the machine translation component, again, we went through a process of selling uh, that component. We, eBay was there, uh, and uh, I, I, just as a background, um, the machine translation and speech recognition, if you looked at them maybe seven, eight years ago, they were not to uh, the level of today, of course, but they were not of the level to say that this is a mainstream technology. You look at them and you see that such technology is still in the lab. You know, the, the computer screws up so much in the translation and still does that today. Uh, obviously, <laughs> you know that if you tried it. And uh, 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 the speech recognition was slow. It was not efficient. It did not have all domains. Uh, maybe systems that focused on command and control type of words like an IVR or medical field. So uh, those were seven, maybe six years ago. And lately that changed, big data, the availability of data, the, abil the availability of uh, what we call training data, having the, the, the parallel text between two languages available and corrected and perfect and therefore you can teach the computer based on statistical approaches here it is you know uh, using the the statistical approach you will able to translate like what human uh, translators do and the same thing training the computer on the audio the the, uh, the acoustic modeling uh, has increased significantly and more, the most important, I think, is the uh, coming of the smartphones, the smart devices. We were, we, uh, technologists were faced with a task that you cannot just run these on servers. You cannot just run these on PCs. You really have, you really have to move and, and, uh, and have such technology run on the, the smart device, whether it communicates with the server or on a standalone uh, basis. So uh, with that background, uh, I think whether it's Google, whether it's eBay, whether it's Microsoft, the translation technology became, made a jump in the last maybe five years uh, again. And it became more and more mainstream. Uh, so uh, eBay acquired the technology as an aqua hire and uh, nine, 10 people from Aptec went with eBay and it was a great synergy for them. It was a product that looking for, and basically they translate 50 to 70 million trans uh, transactions or listings a day. So they wanted to grow their business where if you list an item in English, you can see it translated in German, Russian, Portuguese, Spanish, or if you list it in German, you can see it also in English. And therefore those, the language barrier between between the the the, the companies uh, or the tech, you know the the listings the vendors and the buyers uh, has been uh, reduced significantly. Aptic continues to do um, uh, speech recognition, and as I said, whether it covers media, telephony, or devices, we have released all of the above. So in the meantime, uh, I, I guess I I I continued to think you know sometimes you are faced with problems and you think you know uh, hopefully you can build a technology that provides a solution and that's when i i started the uh, ident tv about three uh, three plus years ago and uh, the main reason i guess i felt that there is a huge problem in understanding video uh, video uh, like I said, it's archived based on metadata. Uh, video is, uh, 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 you don't know who's in the video unless somebody tells you or writes it. Uh, you, uh, you basically, uh, you don't, uh, uh, you are not able to know whether a brand appeared. You're not able to match whether a video uh, uh, had uh, copyrights issue. Are you allowed to show this video or you're not? So. Uh, uh, I, I felt that there is there is a, there is a need to develop uh, uh, real time video understandings and the real time video identification. So we moved into uh, uh, the video. This company, IdentTV. Uh, uh, let me tell you, we 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 basically process. Uh, just to give you an idea uh, of the power of the real time, we are doing. 
40 million image comparisons per second on one core. What that means is that we have, uh, we have uh, to give you uh, some reference, we have around 200 channels in Miami that we ingest real time. And then we have thousands of ads, advertisements, uh, you know, today in the database, maybe there is, uh, I don't know the latest, maybe close to 15,000 and we seek to build maybe another uh, five to 10,000 more. So as the live stream comes in, we compare frames to see whether that ad or that clip has been uh, shown on that TV. And we immediately report within seconds, the system immediately reports within seconds that we have identified a Pepsi ad, we have identified a Coke. Uh, certainly, I mean, people say, well, we do that here and there, but the, our differentiator is we are able to, to know uh, uh, in real time, identify clips, frames, whether it's a second, two seconds, five seconds, uh, two minutes or whatever it is. Uh, uh, another big advantage to that is uh, today there isn't a clear relationship between what is shown on TV and what is uh, and what is uh, 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 what is uh, played or streamed online. We are able to give that information from TV and tell companies, vendors, users, hey, such and such clip appeared, and therefore if you need to do it, triggers action on the on the digital side, we can do that, okay? Uh, now, this, this advanced to two more things. We developed something called the juicer uh, for the video. So basically, we believe that, that, that we needed to uh, basically know more about the video. So we, we have the uh, video fingerprinting based on colors, uh, contours, or all sorts of different data from the actual video. We have the audio fingerprinting, listening and creating more of a, 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 a kind of a audio uh, signal uh, identification of the, that video. We also developed facial recognition. So who appeared on these videos? Which actors? Which, which politicians? How long did they appear? Uh, we can, uh, there is a concept in media here because of the U.S. election about earned media. So how many times did Hillary or Trump appear on TV without the necessity for paying an ad? It's unpaid. Basically, the news presenter would bring a video for, for either of them and show them. So, so it's important to measure what they call this earned media, that they earned it without paying for it. And that applies to brands. How many times a Pepsi can or an Audi car or a Mercedes car appeared in a movie? So basically, Mercedes maybe paid the movie creator, but in essence, now no longer, and they get benefits by showing the hero or the actor or the actress driving uh, a red Mercedes convertible. Uh, so uh, we created more... Uh, uh, information based on this video. We also extracted the closed captioning, so we we are linking the audio and what's being spoken on that video with the exact timing. And if it doesn't exact, if the uh, if the closed captioning for languages doesn't exist, uh, such as Arabic TV, we are able to use the the speech recognition to say here is the text, and therefore you relate to that. These are also important because you, you can understand the sentiment of the video. Is it a good sentiment? Is it a, a happy sentiment? Or is it a horror sentiment? And you can also try but basically again to understand more and more uh, about the video uh, by imposing the social media. So you bring the social media factor and again now you see things that are going on while a movie or a program how does uh, the, the, the users or the viewers are uh, engaging with that? So, so we did, that's the basis of the company. But I would say the biggest vision for it, that we are really developing something that is going to be a huge search engine for the video. So if I can index a billion hours of video and some of it run on a mobile device or PC or TV, smart TV, we will, ab we will be able to detect what is that, what video playing on which smart TV. And the reason for that, again, customer targeting, uh, analytics, uh, data analytics in general, 
so that's why the, the slides say a needle in a haystack in the middle of an ocean. Uh, we are able today with millions of hours, give me a clip, give us a clip, we will say, oh, this clip appeared on Friends uh, show or it appeared on such and such movie. So we believe, all of that, I think the, the biggest reason I, I, I'm saying that is that um, if there is a study by Cisco and the study by Cisco, I, I think it says that today, 70%, uh, let, me, let me go to it. It's, a, it's Cisco Visual Networking Index. It's a forecast and methodology, 2015, 2020 white paper. And it says, you know, that uh, 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 it would take a person five million years to watch the amount of video, of video that will cross the global IP network each month. So if a person needs to set, I guess, five million years, one month to watch what the, you know, uh, one month of video, you would need five million years. So uh, I think the same study says that video traffic is something like 70% yeah. uh, in yeah. 2015. Uh, and by 2020, 2020, sorry, it will be 82 percent. So the, the, it, it is massive. And I, I believe that the technology of today, it, it does not have the ability to understand this data. And that's one of, you know, so many times when you want a startup or you pursue something, you are thinking of solution and the solution mm -hmm. is unique. Uh, the solution hopefully you have a, a leg up on competition and you are able to to beat them to the bunch by uh, basically uh, releasing such a solution okay and uh, uh, the solution has applicability usefulness uh, you don't I don't think it's valid to create solutions because you think you're gonna make just money I, I think people, uh, you know, in general, you have to think of solutions that are more and more uh, 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 to um, uh, provide somebody who's looking at it. I, I spoke on these slides, you know, this is what I meant by looking at OCR, optical, so what, whatever even written on the screen, uh, we want to OCR it so we can get more information. Is it a 1-800 number? for whom you know this is uh, in the states they segment that based on one eight hundred number so mm -hmm. objects we're looking when did you see um uh, you know an iphone when did you see a rolex watch what type of sunglasses this actor or actress are wearing so object recognition is also important so we we are also working on that and we I, have, I have, I have a question for you actually in part of because it's because from, from um, a couple of our listeners. And a lot of people are asking what inspired your companies. And I wanna kind of take that question another step further, which is um, you, you've really laid out, you know, how you saw these problems in, in this sector and, and were able to design solutions behind them and, and what inspired those solutions. But what are the elements to take it from the idea and the inspiration to reality, you know, what kind of team do you need? What were the factors that went into actually inspiring that process and moving it forward? Good question. I guess so. Uh, uh, so I've, I would bring something of a family issue because it's a, like a family feud. You know, uh, I think an individual, for me at least, I would say it's extremely hard for me to sit tight and not keep our mind working. So uh, having the technology background, I would always uh, see problems. I've dealt with the video for 10, 15 years because of the speech. Uh, I wanted to, the main focus always continuously is I, we needed to create an understanding from the speech. So uh, uh, for, for, for many years, that was the main focus. Then later on, I, I guess I realized, so when we started IDEN TV, I realized that uh, probably uh, we, we were trying, I'm gonna uh, uh, share my screen, I guess. Uh, so I don't know if I'm sharing it or not, but uh, I'm there. So when we started, when we started uh, IDEN TV, I wanted to, 
use the iPhone camera or the Android to synchronize between the phone and what's playing on TV. So create that identification. And at that stage, I wanted to say, okay, I'm watching Friends. Okay, what's Jennifer Aniston wearing? Uh, so go one step more. I want, I'm watching a documentary. Who's this person who's the talking? Uh, uh, more informative information that I can see from the video. I am watching something and I really liked a goal somebody scored or a touchdown somebody uh, scored. And I wanted to share it with all the community and friends I have. So this is where I thought that there is so much content out there that we do not understand, we do not use properly, and we do not share. Uh, that is a waste. And I, you know, I, I, a big example even in the Arab world, unfortunately, much of the video and media, they do not, <coughs> they do not even have closed caption. So a lot of it, you don't know what's in the video except what the editor or producer writes in the metadata. So uh, having that, those thoughts, just, you know, thoughts come here and there, and I'm sure we can list everybody sitting down nowadays with the app, it's the, with the smartphones, it's the tip of the iceberg. There is so many things that's going to open up. We're going to see 10 Facebooks, uh, we're going to see Twitters, we're going to see Google. So there are so many companies pop up and, uh, 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 and applications. So uh, I believe technology is changing the nature of how we deal with things, obviously, robots, driveless uh, cars, cars without drivers, obviously. There is there's so much technology that is coming up. And I think what, what inspires, at least inspired me, is seeing a problem that, you know, that keeps haunting me till basically you say, oh, now, yeah, I can find a solution. And sometimes that solution is not clear, and sometimes that solution, obviously, I'm, I apologize if I don't mean uh, to lecture, but sometimes, you know, it takes many many, many hours to keep thinking and following that path till you say, ah, oh, okay, if I do A to Z, then I found that solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I am sharing my, which screen or... Uh, no, no, you're on the right screen now. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. Uh, 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 I want to go back. I don't know if I need to go. Oops, this is... Let me go back to the slides. So basically, we started IDENTV, and again, you have uh, you have to think in the in the IDENTV sense. Okay, uh, I don't know what is this. Mohammed, um, um, did you want the slides to come up on the screen? I, I will in a second. Okay, you are. Okay. I, I wanted to. I, I wanted to say, which relates to the question, mm -hmm. is many times what prevents us from executing an idea. Uh, are aspects relating to, to elements in terms of the CAPEX? Do we have the funding to do it? Do we have the, the infrastructure, computers, uh, network, cloud, whatever is required? Uh, do we have the OPEX? It's not good just to strive, go and buy computers and then you don't have salaries or you don't have rent or you don't have the phone bill or whatever is, is there. Uh, uh, most important, do you have the team? Okay, and I think even if you're a technologist, you cannot be an island. You have, you, you, I mean, people work together. You have to have a cohesive team that is capable of executing that idea very well. Uh, and, uh, and big difference that I see in the US versus the Middle East, and maybe, I, again, I apologize, I, maybe things have changed and are changing, is ownership. I, uh, people have to have vested interest in the company. I cannot just say, hey, here is a couple thousand JDs, uh, dinars, and uh, I'm paying you and you should be happy. Uh, people, that's not enough. I mean, if you if you look uh, uh, at the uh, 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 employees of big companies or small companies uh, have made it is through their options, through uh, equity ownership, through bonuses, uh, through many things. I think this model has to be more implemented, particularly in the uh, technology company, because you invest in people and you invest in their capabilities. And basically, you, you have to maintain that investment. Uh, I mean, everybody on technology knows 
if somebody, if you have a good, a good developer that worked with you for two, three, five years, and that person threatens to leave or leaves, you're in deep trouble. And sometimes, unless you know how, you know, you know all aspects, which is not possible. So keeping and maintaining these people is really the assets of any company. And as you know, I mentioned Acquihire, a lot of the technology companies, they're not looking at just getting an IP, intellectual property and programs and systems, because if they don't have the people, they just sit in the rough on the, uh, you know, on the shelf. I guess I said rough Arabic. Anyway, so, uh, so th these, are, these are things that I think we have, uh, we have tried to build within the team. Uh, you also, which I'll speak more, having an idea and ability to execute it we as technologists unfortunately we fall under we fall with in love with our technology and we we continue to talk about it passionately and all of that stuff big issue that we technologists miss is understanding of the marketing and sales understanding the market uh, you you definitely have to uh, uh, have in your vision and your plans how are you going to get that to the market? How are you going to sell it? What are you going to price it? If it is something new that nobody, uh, and we have the problem with IDENTV, we have so many new services that we don't have a leader that says, hey, this is like, uh, you know, uh, buying an iPhone at $700 or whatever it is, okay? So understanding pricing is, is, is something important. Uh, continuously moving and improving the system by pivoting here and there if you need be. Uh, you cannot stagnate. The technology is extremely, the window of opportunity is, is limited and you cannot stagnate. You really have to continue to improve and advance that technology, okay? I, I, I'm going to move to the slide so I know maybe running over. Okay, so the, this leads me to what I wanted to talk about. So innovation is important for any startup. I, I think today, and especially if you see that a lot of the new companies coming up, uh, it's incremental. You, it, you do not have to reinvent everything from scratch. There are so much uh, open source. There is so much uh, apps here and there that you can use. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it is important to kind of, when you build a system, again, I, I go on my engineering background, to look at the different components and modules and being able to bring them together. Uh, it's important for us in the Middle East, and especially people, you know, in, uh, in Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, you know, in, innovation has no boundaries, okay, no borders, okay. You, you, you are able, if you are able to come up with something good, market through internet, market online applications, Apple Store, Google, all of that, you will, able, you will be able to make a dent. If there is a need for that app or for that solution or what you came up or that product, you certainly, you certainly will, will be uh, able uh, uh, to, to, to get it out to the public. I want to also make sure that we do not copy. I mean, uh, I, things have to adapt. I, some of you might know Uber and Didi. Uh, Uber when, uh, in China, Didi, the other Uber-like, if you know Uber, it's the, the cars that uh, you can, like your own chauffeur, I guess. They use the uh, private cars and so on. They went in China trying to compete with Didi, and Didi kind of won the market. And I think there is a company in India, I forgot what it's called. But again, understanding your, and adapting to your local and regional uh, environment is important. So uh, those are the things. Uh, a couple of slides that Gartner identified the top 10 strategic technology trends for 2017. Uh, uh, you know, it, uh, certainly it plays some of it that we're doing, whether it's the AI. And again, I can provide the link or obviously from the title you can see and find the link and with explanation about each one of them. I think it's important that uh, entrepreneurs in our MENA region have to have the vision for future. You cannot just look at and copy what souk.com did or copy what XY, they did a great job 
Facebook.com, as I said, an example, but, uh, uh, you know, copy things. You really have to know where, where is the mindset of technology uh, and future. And that's important to look at, you know, a report like this because it gives you an idea than just dealing with, with, uh, with things that others have done. And again, I'm going to re-emphasize uh, the point of being able to be local. Uh, even with these top things, how do they apply to your environment? How do they work and provide a solution to your environment? Knowing that this would work, you know, in, in other countries, for example, today, there is a, uh, a company, Intel invested, or a company secured $61 million led by Intel Capital for machine learning. So fields like this are expanding significantly, and they're big. And uh, here is the artificial intelligence uh, uh, scanner, venture scanner, and you will see it's all over the place. Okay, Aptic is mentioned way down in the bottom in terms of the speech uh, translation system. So that's another area. I want, again, because of time, I want to just a couple slides to talk. There is Internet of Things. You look at devices and how it changed the world. Today, we have something like 20 million uh, devices connected in the Internet. By 2020, is around 50 billion. Okay, so it's massive. Anybody who thinks of uh, uh, an idea to work with and exit that idea needs to see how the world is changing. I think that's important. And the last thing, a slide I wanted to put, and I think, as I mentioned, because of uh, this is through the last three years working with Bob Milani in our company, he's the CTO, and sees us always, our weekly team calls focuses on, uh, on uh, technology, okay? And uh, I think he sent me this book uh, a few months ago. And it's important to know that you got to worry about the marketing and sales. How are you going to bring customers in? How are you going to generate revenue? How are you going to pay the salaries? You cannot continue fundraising mode. You got to think and have always, and again, I apologize for, I don't mean to lecture, but you got to worry about the revenue, you got to worry about your payroll, you got to worry about expansion, open a new office, and things like that. In this book, and again, it's available, they, they mention 19 different channels that allows you to kind of test the market and how best to market stuff and how best you are able to, uh, to test which channel works best. Is it participating in expos, like going to Jitex and uh, paying tens of thousands of dollars or going to IBC in Amsterdam? Is it an ad? Is it direct mail? Is it uh, social uh, search engine optimization? Is it uh, newspapers? Is it, you know, there is, is it speeches you give? There is tons of channels and each company has to find its unique way in, in identifying uh, these channels. I think this is this is the uh, sorry I it took longer than I, than I wanted to, yeah. but this is the 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 slide. I think the most important thing I always say that you got to uh, first of all you uh, smart is not enough. You got to really work hard, and as you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you're gonna work eighty hours. If you don't, and you can work forty hours by being an employee, which is fine. People, some people like to do that and some people like to do this. So uh, with, with, with companies that you build, you really have to work to put in the, uh, lots and lots of hours. It's a lot of hard work and certainly some luck. You get a break here or there, you got to take that chance and that break and uh, uh, do your company. Awesome. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Muhammad. Um, we actually do have a couple of questions that have come in, um, in addition to the one I already asked. And the one that we keep getting, and is one of always the most popular questions, is what is the best way to raise funds? And you just mentioned, actually, that you can't just keep raising funds. You actually need to make sure that you design a business model that's going to generate revenue. So what are some tips that you can give, maybe two or three tips that you can give in terms of the best way to raise funds initially, but to make sure that those funds are really invested in an effective way so that your business is sustainable long term? Yeah. Boy, that's, uh, again, that's uh, always... 
a tough question and it varies from company to company. Certainly, the number one thing I believe that whatever you're doing has to have legs. It has to stand as potentially or realistically a good idea. You're providing a solution. There is a requirement and there is a solution. Investors don't anymore, I don't know if they ever were, but sometimes, uh, all the time, investors are smart and they worry about their money and they need, you know, to mitigate any risk of losing that money. So, um, uh, I would say it is no longer enough to raise money, at least I see here in the States and uh, elsewhere, it's no longer enough to raise money on ideas. You really have to have a, a pilot. You really have to have a, a, a working model. Uh, uh, and sometimes the, the problem is so complex that having a pilot is not enough. I, I say an example for IDENTV, uh, because of the ads, when we go to some customers and say we want to sign a contract, the first question would come up, what's your coverage? How many channels can you give me data on? So having the system which was finished a year and a half or a year ago and we keep improving and doing all sorts of things on it was not enough to generate revenue. We needed an infrastructure. So going to investors and tell them, hey, I need funds. Here is the system. It runs great on 20, 30 channels, but I need 300 channels to start with. I need eventually to grow to 1,000 channels. Investors would look, okay, you have some traction. Maybe then we do it. So investors look at some traction that is important that to show them that this solution will sell somehow. Okay, I think... I think going to them without any perspective and any opportunities or revenue here or there might be an issue. Second, you got to be realistic in terms of what it costs to develop. Many people think, you know, oh, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars, or ten. I and again, I or a million. I, I'm not trying. The scale is different here or there. Okay, but I'm saying be realistic on your fund needs. Uh, when you approach investors and say, hey, the, these funds will get me to that stage. Uh, and next, I need more funding or revenue will make me break even. So being upfront with investors is, is extremely important. Uh, I would say uh, 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 investment investors would like to see clean books for the company. You have to maintain your accounting, you have to maintain your contracts, you have to have your NDAs, you have to have your uh, confidentiality agreement with your high tech people, you have to have to look for building and assets like patents. So investors care about seeing a company that is functioning properly and seeing a team that uh, will work well. Uh, investors care that, you know, you're not you're asking for X dollars and you're gonna run out of money in a couple months because your use of fund shows it that this is not enough. So it's hard, uh, I would say. Uh, one study I think Y Combinator was saying, if you want to build an app, it, angel money with family and friends, you need a million and a half dollars today before you go to a series A or something. So it varies from a country to country, but be realistic in what you need. Use incubators, use mentors to help you out in order to, to judge and determine these factors. That's great. I know um, <laughs> Yeah, I have two more questions. Um, one is actually you talked a lot about exits um, and, and selling the company. If, if you could give an entrepreneur advice in terms of in the early like stages of designing and planning the company, how they need to think about preparing for an exit because um, I know it's something that you you need to really take into consideration as you're building out the company um, uh, in the beginning. So what what would be some like top <coughs> two tips for planning for an exit and uh, a piece of advice for for when you're in that process? Yeah, you know sometimes they say exit should not be the solution or, or the target. Uh, I know uh, you know it's tough, but of course, I mean people would need to think at the end how how big of a company am I going to build and what's its value and how this you know create that value for my shareholders, for my employees, for my family, and so on. So I I, I understand. I think I mentioned a little bit on it earlier. I said yeah. First of all, you really have to maintain a good 
clean uh, uh, records of everything that is going on. And I know even, excuse me, even, even my experience many times, you know, oh, we'll finish the financial reports next month. Oh, we'll finish this contract. I know he trusts me, you know, especially in the Arab world and our culture. It's a handshake. You need to have contracts. You, you know, you need to have uh, uh, employees that have, uh, uh, you know, agreed that the, what the work they do is for the company, even confidentiality agreement. Uh, you need to look, if you're coming with unique ideas, patents. Patents not because you want to sue others as much as you want also to protect your company from infringing on others. So having, having a, a clean company is important. I, I think being focused, you know, uh, yeah, and I mentioned that, you know, we work on, within a company you have 10 ideas or 100 ideas. I remember, I think maybe uh, somebody or I read Steve Jobs used to say, I need four, five, six things at the most. So focus is extremely important. You need to know what is, what, what, what is the nature of your company? What is the vision of that company? And kind of chart a path between today and the vision and make sure you're focused and you don't get uh, sidetracked. I mean, we get sidetracked, uh, again, as engineers in 10 uh, different directions, if not more. So focusing, being able to prepare that, making sure you grow in revenue, making sure, and again, you know, some people say growth in revenue is great, but it's not a criteria. It's true if you have a unique idea that has uh, uh, millions of users, people would say even, you know, some of these big companies till today they lose money, yet their value is in the billions, okay? So uh, there isn't a real great recipe. I think you need exposure. You need to look for companies that you are synergetic with, uh, you know, uh, as I said, companies are bought, not sold, but having somebody and having your company out in the media and having your company blogs and having your emails with people uh, participating in shows, the, the different channels of creating awareness, social media, creating awareness around your company will create the different uh, basis for a, a proper and a good exit but you have to be patient obviously I mean uh, you know as I mentioned going through uh, an acquisition it, uh, that I don't know if anything can happen in 30 60 days I I doubt it you will have to look that something like that you need to be persistent patience uh, patient until something like that happens okay. Um, and to close out, because um, we're running out of time, but if you could uh, say what you think the biggest factor of your success and about what an, uh, how an entrepreneur can be successful, what would you say the biggest factor is? Wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, again, it's so subjective. Uh, um, I, I, I really think, as I said also in the discussion, that having a good idea is not enough. I mean... Uh, you really, really got to work hard. I cannot overemphasize that the biggest thing that you have to, to uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, you know, you cannot afford to be lazy, unfortunately. You, you have to pursue your dreams. You have to work on the, the idea. You, you can get lucky here or there. Certainly somebody sees it and says, oh, wow, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Okay, uh, uh, but um, I believe hard work um, uh, being, uh, I would say, it's extremely important to be transparent with your customers. Do not overpromise. You know, you're 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 building a company. You your credibility is on the line. Uh, if if a reference is bad about you here or there, it affects you for years. It's like going downhill, and now you need to climb uphill again to reestablish that credibility. So you have to you have to create a, a business model that you deliver. I mean, if you promise that this will do one, two, three, okay within the margin of error plus or 10 minus 10 percent probably acceptable but in general you got to uh, have the credibility that your system or your technology or your your product would work uh, uh, yeah I mean these are the things uh, I, I would say that make a success um, uh, 
Uh, and and I, I also would say, I mean, focus is important, but I also would say, you know, managing your financials is extremely important. You know, uh, if you get a funding from investors, don't, you know, go all over, you know, building a, a, an empire state while you really need to have a tent at the beginning. So uh, managing these resources properly is important. Uh, being able to communicate with your team is extremely important. Everybody needs to be on the same page. You know, uh, you don't need people going on their own development as they wish while, uh, you know, you have a vision and you have a path. So some of these factors, I'm sure uh, many of them will, uh, as we say, will burn their fingers uh, learning. It's, it's uh, uh, growing pains, I would say. You know, you have to learn on the job. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Mohammed. We were so happy to have you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the, this edition of uh, the TechWadi Abana web series. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you thank all. You.